the goals took a long time in coming. Uh, we thought for a long time we weren't going to score ourselves, but when we got the breakthrough, uh, there was no way back. We knew we were going to beat them then. If that move had broken down and Inter would have broken away and scored a goal, I should get my backside kicked. Jim Craig had overlapped on the right-hand side, and here was he squaring the ball to me just outside the box. An Italian defender hesitated uh, and turned back uh, just as I was shooting. If that had been blocked and Inter had gone up and scored, I was the one that was going to get a bollocking because I shouldn't have been up there when Jim Craig was up there. But it just shows you how things, uh, you do things the wrong way, but they turn out uh, correct. Five minutes left now. One goal each. Gimel. Murdoch. It's gone! Celtic has scored! Only five minutes to go, and without a doubt, the European Cup is on its way to Glasgow. But as so often with the old firm supporters, it became difficult to differentiate between celebration and invasion. The excessiveness of the fans' joy marred the occasion slightly for some. The only disappointing thing for me was I was on my own, the rest of the players weren't there, which was disappointing. By the time I got back to the dressing room, I lost the Inter Milan shirt that I'd exchanged my own jersey for. I lost a pair of boots, but it didn't. everybody lost something that day, and I'll tell you, it was quite funny, going back in after the game, I always remember this, the bus was going back in and we passed a, a, a car with a whole lot of Portuguese in it. And there was about three of them waving boots and stockings out the window, you know, telling us that they had the stockings. But uh, they were unimportant things, it was just the fact that we had uh, gone and won the thing. It was a marvellous experience. Five years later, it was Rangers' one, turn uh, under uh, Willie Waddle. They were in Barcelona in the final of the Cup Winners' Cup for the second time. On this occasion, their opponents were Moscow Dynamo. Rangers were looking for something better than the two-each draw of 1945. Towards Colin Steen. Steen is a goal! It's a goal by Steen! What a goal! Smith going up. It's a good ball, it's a goal! It's a goal by Willie Johnston. and here's Willie Johnston with a chance and it's a goal it's a goal by Johnston right out of the blue Rangers three up incredibly three up here's Matheson and it's a bad one it's a great chance for the Russians and that's a goal number 13 has scored Estrakov I look back in that game and I've got a, it's only recently I've got a full video of that Matheson. game and you've been looking what a terrible match it was I've got, I've got to be fair and say that it was a terrible game. It must have been a terrible game to watch, although it was exciting from the supporters' point of view. But I had a terrible chance, uh, terrible time trying to get fit for that match. I'd been out for about six weeks with a bad ankle, and quite honestly, I shouldn't have played that night. I wasn't fit. In the last 20 minutes, it, it was a lack of match practice that had us pinned back. We just couldn't get out. We were hemmed in. Uh, there's always a stage in the game when the initiative goes to the opposition. And it was a, um, a question of both, you know, the initiative went to the Russians and also lack of match practice, especially late in the game. And it's a goal! It's a I also remember the last quarter an hour, every time the referee blew his whistle, I thought, I hope that's the final whistle, because I was absolutely shattered. And we'd seen him coming back to 3-2, and I thought, oh no, we've got to win it this time, because I don't think that we'll get another chance. And uh, then the fans started coming in the park, and. I kept looking at the referee, and I've been getting on well with the referee for most of the game. And I said, oh, Feeney, Feeney, and he, he kept going and going. And Eventually, when the game finished, uh, the relief. The relief was short-lived. Rangers had won 3-2, but what should have been a parade developed into a riot. The cup Rangers had played so hard to win became a little tarnished. Look at them, and Rangers players somewhere in the middle of all that. This crowd got behind me, and I'm struggling for air, and the big fella, Big Stuart Daniels, he's um, a big Ranger supporter, a really good Ranger supporter. And he was shouting, oh, we've done it, wee man, we've done it. And he grabbed me with three days of growth and phew, he's scratching me. And I'm shouting, Stuart, I'm struggling, I'm struggling, you know. So a couple of his mates, he got them back and he got us up and he filtered me over, you know. And 
I was really under pressure, to tell you the truth, and that's what I remember, you know, and it was, um, it's not the best of memories, is it? Yeah, that's a tender spot in my life, because you, you just live to parade cups, don't you? And the fans came on too quick, about a minute before the game finished with a foul, and they came on, and they just invaded again. And I thought, I don't think that would happen now with, with, with the, the type of police they've got. Their authority was being questioned, so they just, the police did what they were trained to do, and they, they are charged. And the Rangers fans did what they were apt to do, they charged for a fight, you know. Uh, but it upset me terribly, and it upset the players that they couldn't get this, this uh, show the world, this cup outside the stadium, you know, it was on, on the part sort of thing. To me, that was the biggest disappointment, uh, well, one of the biggest disappointments of my life, not to be able to, to get the cup and to be able to run round the pitch, because that is something special. But I think a thing about that is that once we got in the dressing room, the players didn't realise, we just knew that they were all in the park and they were jumping about, we didn't realise that, uh, the, well, the police and there was a batting charge and the stadium got a wee bit damaged and that. I represented the cup in a room not bigger than this. Uh, me, myself, and by the time I got back to the dressing room, all the guys were in the, the bath and it was a bit of an anticlimax because really I think that if you win a European trophy, you at least like to do a lap of honour and let your fans see it. And uh, I don't think half the Rangers supporters ever saw that cup. And then we had the ban after it as well. And, uh, basically a lot of the glory of winning that cup uh, was lost in the after effects and what happened after it. Seconds ticking away. Back in Scotland, Rangers proceeded to reassert themselves over Celtic. In 1976, under the managership of Jock Wallace, they completed the treble of Scottish League, Scottish Cup and League Cup. And there is John Craig. That team never got the press, the publicity for uh, what they were and what they did. That may have been my fault because I, I, I was project I, I hid behind the hard man image and we, we didn't coach and we didn't do this. And, but over the piece, every player except McDonald played and Malik Miller played for Scotland. You know what I mean? At any time. There was one time that there were Jardine, Forsyth, Jackson and Greg had all captain Ray A Scotland in that year. In 1978, Rangers won the treble again. But as experience in Europe had shown, both Rangers and Celtic have for a long time had a dangerous element following them, ready to rob them of the sweetness of success like a mugger. Hamden, 1980. Celtic had just beaten Rangers 1-0 in the Scottish Cup final. The religious bigotry that attaches itself to both clubs and which many people prefer not to talk about erupted spectacularly. It looked as if in Scotland we were still fighting the last skirmishes of the Thirty Years' War. At the end of the day, let's not kid ourselves, these supporters hate each other. And they itch to get at each other. Scottish commentators covering Rangers and Celtic games may have sometimes felt they were doubling as war correspondents. The causes of the conflict go back a long way. Celtic Football Club was founded for admirable reasons by Brother Wilfred of St Mary's School. But the continued insistence of the Catholic Church in Scotland that Catholic children must remain segregated from Protestants at school can't be a great help to mutual understanding. Also, the Irish flag flying at Parkhead can be seen as provocative. There's no significance of flying the, the tricolour other than to honour the people who started the club. And it flies now with any amount of flags of countries that we have played in and competed against. But the, the tricolour is not anything else but in honour of the people who actually started the club, Brother Wolfram. That's the reason for that flag being flying. Three lined up, Lynch, Douglas and Glavin. Certainly, Celtic have never practiced religious discrimination in the signing of players. Kenny Dalglish, for example, is Protestant. If you take, for example, you have Jock Steen, a great captain, Willie Lyon, a great captain, Bobby Evans, a great captain, none of these lads were Catholics. It was never, never given a minute's thought. Uh, <laughs> If somebody came along and said just now that they could produce somebody could put a ball in the back of the net three times every Saturday in 90 minutes, I wouldn't bother very much. I wouldn't bother at all. <laughs>